Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, getting a little bit cold, isn't it? You can see all the, the left hand will be damaged. I can't be eating up a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, let's just uh, open up our service in a word of prayer. Come uh, see if you can be honest. Nice and late to the camp here. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are so blessed and grateful and thankful, Lord, that we have this uh, midweek service that we can just get away from the world just for a short period of time, just do fellowship with uh, like minded believers, Lord. But uh, the main thing is to come and honour and glorify and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time. We pray, Lord, for everybody here and ask for your blessings upon them and also for those who are by the uh, social media as well, ask for your blessings upon them. But we know, Lord, there's people who can't make uh, either one of them because of ill health and other issues, Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that uh, you would just lay your healing hand upon them. We pray, Lord, now for this service. We pray, Lord, for the time for this teaching. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the, the preacher and teacher that uh, you have set before us, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you use him to impart your will in your way. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just give you some announcements and some... Uh Things. Uh, don't forget prayer night. We've got three. Thursday is ladies' prayer night at six o'clock. Uh, you can turn up to the church, the man over here, my wife, and some of the other ladies as well. Uh, on Friday we have men's prayer, which is at six o'clock. That's uh, live Zoom. Um, and get in touch with Brother Jamie if you want to be added to the list. Also, don't forget Sister Janet uh, Nelson. She's uh, doing FaceTime prayer. Is there a specific time when she does that? Is it just on a Friday? It's 7 o'clock. No, no. 7 o'clock on the Friday. Okay, we need to do that. Uh, 7 o'clock on the Friday. So if, you, if you're homebound or you can't make to the ladies prayer, but you still want to have a time of prayer with your, your, your sisters in the Lord, get in touch with, uh, with Janet Nelson and uh, she'll, she'll add you to the list. Uh, be in your places for the Sunday services, Sunday morning at 10.30. Again, you've got to book your slots online. Uh, we have a uh, track and trace now as well. So if you've got the app and you want to, you want to use that, that's up to you. Uh, Sunday PM, uh, six o'clock. You don't have to book on that. You just come in, sign your name in, uh, and I think that's everything for normal services. Uh, some things that are coming up every Thursday now uh, at nine thirty. We have our moms and tots. Uh, run by Sister Karen at the moment and she needs help so if anyone can come, come along and give her a hand she's going to need all the help she can get because every week it's getting more and more people yeah. and uh, you know, she needs to uh, have some assistance yeah. excellent time to, to, to serve the Lord also soon, keep it in your prayers we know that uh, coffee morning is coming up um, um, a date yet? No, no, no. Okay, but just, just keep praying about it because it's something you want to start up again. Also, uh, lunch and club is going to be starting up soon. For all these ministries, we're going to try and get things back to normal so we can start fellowshipping with each other, uh, reaching out to the community. Uh, on Sunday, someone asked me, and it's not been the first person, it's the second and third person there, been asking if we can go into evangelising. Uh, not just tracks through doors, we've got some people that actually want to go on the streets again evangelised on the streets uh, and so just keep your prayers for that because uh, that takes courage, takes commitment, dedication uh, so uh, just keep praying because we've got some numbers, at least four people have come forward saying they want to do that so we, we pray the Lord for that uh, what else have we got Team Sunday School is going to be back on on the 25th of October and I think after that it's going to be bi-weekly, every two weeks uh, uh, Jamie uh, and, and Sister Nelson are running that. I think uh, Danny's got, got his uh, finger in that pie as well, and helping out there. And uh, let me think what else. Some prayer notices. Uh, keep praying for the college. Keep praying for Brother Weeks. He's, uh, if we keep saying he's separated from his wife, I think it's the wrong way of saying it. He's not divorced. Okay. His wife's in America. And uh, she's helping to look after the family there because of the COVID thing. And there's some family. Uh, struggles that a daughter's having and uh, and and they're just se separate in that respect and you know it's not nice being away from the party so uh, just pray for him uh, as he runs the college as well keep praying for new life as we all cover the services here, here at temple and, and uh, i think pastor grits and brother weeks are doing that as well uh, and just keep praying that people keep turning up uh, and that the church will keep growing over there in telford keep praying for the pines tj and his family 
and also keep praying for the McHenry family. Is there, is there a uh, quarantine finished now? No, they've got one more week. They've got one more week left, so just keep praying for them. And uh, I think that's all the, the major announcements. Uh, we've got a personal one there. Uh, we have a, a new part of the church. Uh, Brother Jeff Mick is now a granddad again. Mm -hmm. For the third time. Uh, Marty and uh, Marty. Mary and uh, Andrew uh, have a baby girl. Farrah, Joyce, Jeff Mick. Uh, seven pound three ounces. Thirteen ounces. Thirteen ounces. Yeah, seven pound thirteen ounces. What night was it? It was Monday, 1447 at the time, wasn't it? Okay, 1447. Okay. And there's mother? Mother as well. She, she, she's got a one or two minor issues, but uh, she does need prayer. But um, mother and baby are doing well. Yeah. Baby is um, feeding well, and uh, she's got an appointment on Saturday, I think, for um, just a, a check-up. But uh, she, she's a lovely fellow. She's got a mop of hair on it. So it won't be long before she's there in her head. But, yeah. but uh, I was talking to the lady in the sweet shop today, and uh, they went and bought some stuff. And uh, I said, we've got a bit of a mixture. It's a bit of a cultural diversity because she's got a, and a, um, an Arabic first name and a Russian second name. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> her, her father is English and her mother is Scottish. So, you know, it's, um, it, 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 shall, shall I say it's interesting? We also have these sheets at the back as well, if you want to take one of these. Uh, it's basically a, Bible planner, reading through a Bible planner, it says commit to spending 10 minutes every day to meditate and reflect on God's word. Write down what you have gleaned from each one of these scriptures. And it's basically a Bible verse or a, 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 a section of scripture for each day of the week through October. And Mrs. Boots has brought them in. Uh, so if you, if you want to take one of them. And, uh, so do that with our Bible study. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. What day are we on? Four. Right? Four. Someone says four. Yeah, Whoever says four, they were right here. Yeah. We're on the fourth day. We're on the fourth day. We'll do, we'll, as normal, we'll do a quick recap on where we are. So we, we first of all, we dealt with day one. Now you probably can't see this very well. You, if you really want to see, come up, take a picture of it, uh, hopefully it kind of gives you a better understanding of what's going on as we go verse by verse through the book of Genesis. What happened on day one? Can anyone remember off the top of the head? What happens on day one? God created the heavens and the earth. earth. Pardon? God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, yeah. Something else. Let there be light. Let there be light. Separation of light and darkness. Let there be light. And there's a separation of light and darkness. So this is the earth here. Okay, so we have light. Remember we said it wasn't the sun, moon and stars because that comes on the fourth day. We saw in the scriptures it was the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, and we have a night time and we have daytime. So that's what we see, the separation of light and darkness. So we see that the day starts. On the second day, we see the creation of the two atmospheres and its separation from each other with water. So we have, do you remember the word firmament was a jewel, it wasn't a plural. It was a jewel, which means only two. So we have space and we have the sky. So now we see the introduction of the atmosphere that we have. We have space. But also, you remember, water was there that separated them. And so there was some form of canopy that's believed around the earth, <coughs> which kind of might cause some type of greenhouse effect on the earth. That's why everything grew bigger. We know from uh, uh, scientists have, have found amber, uh, like tree resin with oxygen, caught inside and the oxygen levels were 50% greater than what we have and so it's believed during that period of time there was high oxygen levels everything you know it's like a hyperbaric hyperbaric chamber uh, we also says that there was water out there in space anyone seen the news the last couple of days <coughs> and what have they been saying life on mars they think there's water on mars and they're getting all excited because life needs water to survive but guess who told us that way before? It was God. God was telling us in the scriptures way before that there was uh, water out there in space. On the third day, can anyone remember what happened? <coughs> Josh, can you get me the water? 
on the third day? C. C. Okay, so we have the sea was contained into one place. So this is the earth. That's a cut section into the earth. So C was contained into one space or one place. And we have what we call the Pangean continent. That once upon a time, the, all the continents of the earth were together. So there was just literally one landmass. So when everyone asks you the question, how did the penguins get on the ark from the Antarctica? It was one landmass. All the animals just travelled to the ark. It wasn't a problem. Okay? Uh, and we're going to see when we get to the flood, the flood causes massive or catastrophic uh, destruction to the earth. The, the tectonic plates start to rip apart uh, rapidly to the point where within one year, because that's how long the flood lasts, the flood period, we're going to see that as well. Within one year, the world that we see today is what we had after the flood. Okay, So this is something that's completely different. Uh, so there's this supercontinent, the gathering of the seas together. We also saw uh, <coughs> creation of vegetation, uh, which is edible, and it's also self-replicating. We've never been able to do that. We can create food, but food, once it's eaten, that's it, it's gone. But God gave us self-replicating food. In the seed is the information to grow more plants, which produces fruit, which gives you more seed. You know, isn't that amazing? Uh, we cannot do that. You know, this is what I'm saying. When we're talking about creation, I mentioned this on Sunday. When we talk about creation, we're talking about the genius, the handiwork of God. Thank you. We're talking about the handiwork of God. We're going to see, especially when we get to the creatures, the DNA that's involved, uh, the information that God has placed within each one of us is beyond even our understanding. The smartest people on this earth still have not scratched the surface of this creation and how complex and detailed it is. So we saw on the third day then the creation also of vegetation uh, and its ability to reproduce itself. It would be at this point as well that the creation of the tectonic plates, that's what we're, the earth is sitting on, uh, that would have had occurred at this time. Also we see, do you remember it talks about uh, in the book of Genesis that the waters of the deep broke forth. So underneath the earth was placed uh, the waters of the deep. We also believe it's at this point that Sheol was created. Sheol is a place where dead people go. Now why would God create it right there at this point? No one's dead. He knew that it was going to happen. It says that the names of the people that were written in the book of life from the creation of the world. So he knew the plan. He knew that everything was going to happen. He knew the fall was going to come. So he plans for the fall. And also you have molten metal in the middle of the earth. Iron and nickel. And what does that produce? A magnetic force. A magnetic force. So now we have the magnetic field. Uh, and remember we said the magnetic field cannot, the weights degrade, uh, breaking down at the moment, cannot be older than 10,000 years old. Okay. okay, so let's go to the fourth day. That's where we are so far. Uh, <clears throat> verse 14 through to 19. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule uh, the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them into the, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So today we're going to look at the creation of the luminaries, or or what God filled the universe with. And this is the thing that you see in Genesis. God creates like spaces and then fills the spaces. Uh, so he created the firmament and then the first thing he fills with the firmament is st stars. He created the landmass and we're going to see after he deals with the stars he's going to deal with what fills that landmass. What fills the landmass? Animals. Animals and people. So he says, first of all, the new lights in verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Now previously there had already been three days. Uh, we're on the fourth day. And 
the three days were lit up by the glory of God. We saw that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Remember that verse? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's what that light was. It was the glory of God. It tells us there in that verse. But this does not mean that the previous three days have not been 24-hour periods. Okay? And the reason, because in each one of those days it states evening and morning, and then it says at the very end it was night and then it was day. This is talking about 24-hour periods. And so God puts a, a substitute light there for the first three days until the sun is created in the moon and the stars. Okay? This also goes against uh, people who hold the Big Bang Theory. Uh, they believe the sun comes first. It's the sun that starts and then the planets start to orbit the sun afterwards. Uh, but the Bible teaches it the opposite way around. It says that the earth was created first and then the sun was created afterwards. This view also goes against modern, oh sorry, mo mo sorry, pagan views. And when we say pagan, what do we mean by pagan? What's a pagan? It's a false belief, but what's specific about pagans? They, well, they, they it's, it's spiritually, it's spirit, it has some spirituality to it, but it's not biblical, it's not of God. It's, from, God. it's against God. They worship the creation instead of the creator. They worship creation instead of the creator. So they'll have like man gods, like Thor, or they'll have specific seasonal gods. So, you know, like winter and autumn, so they'll have gods like that. Or they'll have like gods of the mountain or gods of the forest. No matter where you go in the world, uh, be it North America, South America, Australia, every single country that's been untouched by even our Western civilization, when we get there, they all believed in gods, but they corrupted the way that they thought about God, the view of God, the right view of God. And we'll look at that when we get to the Terror of Babel, that everyone was spread all over the world. So people originally had a bright idea of God. But let's say, for example, Native Americans. Uh, we go to the Native American people. What sort of things do they believe, Pastor Grits? No, they believe in the ancient uh, uh, beliefs, their, their uh, ancestors. ancestors, Yeah. The spirits of the animals, yeah. the spirit of nature. Yeah. They believe all of those things are... Or, or what they came from. Yeah. Aztecs, who are not Aztecs believe in? Sort of things that Aztecs believe in? Sun. Sun. Most pagan religions believe the sun is one of the ultimate gods. Okay, so they believe in their pagan religions that the sun was always created first. And so what we see here is that God does it the other way around. The earth is first, and, and obviously God was first before all that. Early church fathers, I'll give you the names whether you know them, Theophilus, Bishop of uh, Autolycus, and Basil the Great, what names, mm -hmm. who would have faced genuine opposition from pagans. You remember when Paul went into some of his, these cities in the book of Acts? They were genuine pagans. They really believed that people, remember when they stone Paul, they believed in Jupiter and Hermes. These were gods that came down from the heavens and mingled with us. Uh, the Apostle Paul really faced these sort of, this sort of opposition. And so they would have used these sort of passages to show that the sun was just part of creation. It's just another element in the skies. And the Apostle Paul says that. You know, he says that creation testifies to, to a creator, uh, as he says in the book of Romans. So the sun was created afterwards. So what was the purpose of the luminaries? What was the purpose of all these lights in the sky? To separate the, the day from night. The day from night. The seasons. Seasons. To provide light. Yeah. To provide light. Okay, it does tell us, verse 15, and let them be for signs and for seasons. So first of all, he says they're signs. So the original intent of the moon is to take over, first of all, for the Shekinah glory, to supply light to the earth. Okay, but the second one it says is signs. But what are the signs for? So what, what sort of signs? Travel. Pardon? Travel. Travel. Okay, that's right. In the book of Job, chapter thirty-eight, verse thirty-one and thirty-three. Job thirty-eight, thirty-one and thirty-three. 
He, Job says, uh, God speaking to Job says this, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of uh, Pleiades? And you think, what's that mean? It's the word that means seven stars. It's talking about, uh, what's, what's the term now? Constellation. Constellation. A constellation. He's talking about a constellation of stars. Or loose the bands of Orion, which again is a con another constellation. Or canst thou bring forth Maseroth? Maseroth means the 12 stars. Uh, uh, again, another constellation in his season. Or canst thou guide, or literally guide them, uh, meaning guiding people? Because what were people using stars for back in the day? They were using stars for travel because they're stuck in the sky. You know exactly where you're going when you follow the stars. And most Middle Eastern men, especially shepherds or farmers or people that lived in the, you know, in the countryside, would use stars to travel. Uh, it says, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons, and, and literally another constellation of stars. So he's naming lots of different constellations of stars. Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? So these are all constellations. The purpose were for signs for people to, to follow. So God gave us, if you like, maps for the world in a sense, to, so we know where we're going. But another sign is it's a sign of the glory of God. That this is God's handiwork. This is God's creation. In Psalms 19 verse 1 it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmness showeth his handiwork. You know, it's, it's an evidence that God exists. And we're going to see that more and more as we go through. That these, these are genuine evidences that God created the universe. We baffled by it. One of the things you've probably seen as we've been going through, I'm trying to tell you what evolutionists and Big Bang theorists believe. And it just isn't adding up. And, and when you understand what they believe, and then you actually... You won't, hopefully you can take some of this information and you won't feel threatened when you get into a conversation with someone because you can see how foolish a lot of these things are that they believe. Another, so, another reason they were given is seasons. I think it was Janet that says that. We see here that seasons began in the creation week. Uh, Psalms 104 verse 19 says this, He appointed the moon for seasons and the sun knoweth his going down. You know the Bible uses figure of speech. Sometimes that's picked upon, and people say, "Well, the Bible, the sun doesn't go down." Well, but we all use that sort of terminology anyway, don't we? You know, it's just normal terminology. We call it anthropomorphism, where God's trying to talk to us in our language so that we can understand. But this means now that the Earth is tilted. So before that, the Earth was upright. Because it means that now it's tilted. Okay. Uh, then he says days. Here's another recurrence of the word day. And just like the signs, the seasons and the years that are mentioned in this verse, it should be taken literally. So this is a, these are literal days. Previously days were measured by Earth's rotation uh, in relation to God's light. Uh, but now it's in reference to the sun. Because the sun's being created. I'm going to draw the sun. It's not that close. <laughs> what would happen if the sun was that close? And then he says, years, now the earth begins to rotate around the sun. So now we have the earth rotating around the sun. So we have a lot of movement going on. The seasons means now we have a tilt. Unless you're a flat earther. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's another class. Okay, uh, so we have a tilt. We, it's already orbiting. We this has gone there. The Shekinah glory is gone. We don't need that no more. And then it's rotating around the sun. Okay, so the years now the Earth begins to rotate around the sun. Now this begs the question. Remember, does anyone remember how big the universe was? We said. No. It's very big. It's very big. Yeah. Just to give you an idea, it's 92, we'll put it like it's light billion years or billion light years, yeah, across from point to point, and it's constantly expanding. I'm not sure how to measure it, I'm not sure at all how to measure it, but uh, that's how big it is. And people have questioned why does God need to create a universe so big 
and have a little tiny earth in the middle of it for us. You know, it seems so insignificant. And atheists like to pick on this and, and, and say it's pointless. You know, this, we're, we're insignificant in this universe. You know, this, this wicked world, this dangerous universe that we live in, we're nothing, we're just a speck. Okay. Stephen Hawkins, when he was alive, speaking on the BBC, said this. We are such insignificant creatures on a minor planet of a very average star in, a, in the outer suburb of one of a hundred billion galaxies. So it is difficult to believe in a God that would care about us or even notice our existence. And that's the way that the, the unbeliever sees the world. But the Christian perspective is the opposite. It, it shows how much he loves us, how, 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 how important we are to God. King David was also aware of our tininess compared to the rest of the universe and came to a completely different conclusion. And in Psalms uh, chapter 8, verse 3 through to 9, he says this, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou made, madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, ye and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Amen. God created the universe so vast to demonstrate really his power. It's baffling them. They don't understand. Remember we said that the universe is 13.7 billion years old according to them and yet it's 92 billion light years across. That doesn't make sense. It, it, it couldn't catch up with itself. It, it's travelling at the speed of light from the centre of the universe and you travel for 13.7 billion years. You're not even going to get halfway to the end of the universe. That's how, how, how baffling it really is. So God created the universe so vast to demonstrate his power. If he made it too small, I'm sure the atheists would then say, well, God's puny. Mm -hmm. They would go to the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So God created this greater light, and we call it the sun. Uh, in verse 16, he says, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. Uh, and then he goes on to say in verse 17, God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. Now, some again have suggested that God calls the light, the sun, the greater light, which is kind of giving some strength to pagan views. And, and it's not because, remember, pagan views is that the sun was created first, but God made it on the fourth day. It's not important in that respect. It's not a deity. It's not a God at all. God makes it clear that they are never ever to be worshipped. Never worship the creation over the creator himself. In Deuteronomy 4.19 it says, Let thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God have divided unto all the nations under the whole earth. He's saying, don't do this, you know, don't worship these things, they're just creation, they're just part of his creation. Just some facts here. The sun is 1.4 million kilometres in diameter. That's big. <laughs> Keep in mind we're only 8,000 miles wide. Okay. 109 times the size of the Earth. 1.3 million times the Earth's volume. So in other words, you can get the Earth and put it inside of the sun 1.3 million times. Yeah. Its surface is 5,504 Celsius. A bit hotter than a kettle. <laughs> While the core of the Earth is 14 million Celsius, 14 million Celsius, and the Sun is 150 million kilometres away from the Earth, and this adds to what is referred to by scientists as the Goldilocks effect. Anyone ever heard of the Goldilocks effect? Do you know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears? And remember the porridge? What was wrong with the first porridge? It was too hot, and what was wrong with the second porridge? It was too cold, and the third porridge was just right. just right. And seriously, the scientists call this the distance, the size of the earth, the tilt of the earth, 
the orbit of the earth, the size of the sun, they call it the Goldilocks effect, because it's just perfect. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it was just a few miles either direction, you have problems. This, this is how, how we know. Do you know what's at the north and the south of, of, of the uh, globe? Ice caps. What's that telling you? It's cold. It's cold. <laughs> At them points, it's cold. So you can imagine if you nudge the Earth just a little bit further, what would happen? Really? It would be it would be an ice wall, yeah. But what would happen if you nudged it the other way? It would be too warm. It's the Goldilocks effect. It's perfect. It's 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 designed. It's meant to be that way. That's the way that God created it. So Genesis described the sun then as the greater light to rule the day. Uh, the word great and masal, which means dom to dominate. And it does, doesn't it? When the sun's out, it dominates the day. You go out and you can feel the rays of the sun. So that's the sun. But then it talks about another light, the lesser light, in verse 16. And God made two great lights. And then he says, And the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give the light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. What colour is the moon? It's a uh, stone colour. Black. <laughs> it's actually black. Yeah. It's basalt, it's igneous rock, pure black. But when you look at it, what colour is it? White. It's white. Reflecting. Yeah. It's funny because yesterday, was it yesterday, Adam? Uh, Adam says to me, he says, look at the moon. He was sitting in the living room and I went to the front door and it was just glowing. I thought that was for my lesson, no, so I could tell you why. <laughs> you, you've seen it. Has anyone ever travelled around the world? I've seen pictures, but when you get certain parts of the, the especially on the equator, I don't know if it's the, the equator where the Earth is, I suppose, I mean the moon is, the, the, the moon is massive, it's huge, you know, you can see it and it's just, it just looks like someone's blown it up like I've seen, I've seen it on TV, but it, it's there to give light, to give us light at night time. And I used to go camping, and it's amazing. I go. I used to go every single weekend, pretty much camping. And and when everyone goes to bed, it's amazing how things change. Noise travels so far. You can hear so many things. Also, from miles away, you can hear things happening. But you can see the light of the moon because there's no light pollution at all, and your eyes adjust to it. Yeah, it takes about twenty minutes for your eyes to adjust to night sight, but once it kicks in. You can, you can see everything quite clearly, mm -hmm. and it's all because of, of the moon. Yeah. So with the creation of the moon, we also see the introduction of tides. Uh, what are tides for? Have you ever thought about that? Because the gravitational pull of the moon pulls the oceans. What's the purpose of that? No, it has a purpose. Is it to ox ox oxygenate the water? Yeah, it cleans the ocean. If, if, if we never had a moon, the ocean would be still. And what happens with still water? Stagnant. It goes stagnant, it stink. The whole earth would be just smelly. <laughs> it would stink, yeah. So it's to prevent the oceans from stagnating. So the tidal effects of the moon actually clean the oceans. So the oceans now have been moving backwards and forwards. We have tidal falls. The moon is actually receding from the earth by four centimetres a year. It's getting further and further away. We haven't drawn the moon yet. Some little crouches on it. Okay. Yeah, so it's moving away from the earth four centimeters a year. Yeah, that's good because it means if we reverse the process, we can find out when the moon was sitting on the surface of the earth, if you like. But it wouldn't have got that far, it would have exploded. It would get to a certain distance to the earth, and the gravitational pulls would be too strong, it would have exploded. So this means if we were to reverse the time, the moon would have collided with the Earth's surface 1.37 billion years ago. Now, that's a problem for the Big Bang guys again, because they believe it's 4.53 billion years old. So how do they reconcile that? That's something that they have to deal with. Now, it's at this point as well that God creates, what else? Stars. Stars. Okay, so now we have stars, uh, and we also have, I believe at this time, one of them, shooting stars, 
Okay, I also believe it's at this time, I'm almost willing to see this now, we're going to see someone else. What are these? Planets. Planets. Okay, so the word for star in Hebrew is a kokab. This refers to any small, bright, heavenly object which would equal any of these things, stars and planets. Mm -hmm. Because remember, when they looked out at the planets, we look out there with our telescopes and we can see pretty much a full picture of what a planet looks like. Mm -hmm. What do you think they were seeing when they were looking up? They would see dots. They're just like we see a moon. That's, you know, if the sun wasn't there, we wouldn't see the moon. It's a, the, the moon is reflecting the sun's light. And it's the same with the planets. As we look out, they reflect in lights off the sun or the, or, or the stars in, in, in the rest of the universe are reflecting off them. And so uh, we see here the creation of, uh, of, of stars, planets, and uh, shooting stars, which are, what's, what's a shooting star? Yeah, it's a meteorite. It's just a meteorite, yeah. Uh, can you get the slides up, please, Adam? Mm -hmm. We've got some slides here. Okay. So the, these are planets. Uh, Mercury's number one. Then you see Mars, Venus, and Earth. So there's Earth. So if you go on to, on to the next one, number two there, the very small one there is Earth. And then we see Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn and Jupiter. And then if we go back to number three, there's Jupiter, the small one. And then we see bigger planets that the faint and bigger stars. So we have one called Wolf 59, the sun. There's the size of the sun. There's, there's a, I think it's a, I don't think it's a planet, I think it's a star, Cyrus. And then if you go to number four, there's Cyrus. See how small Cyrus is now? I'm going off screen, yeah. And then these are all stars, so you can imagine how massive these things are. The sun's nothing. Remember, we fit into the earth uh, just over a million times. I mean, we fit into the sun just over a million times. The earth could fit in some of these billions of times. That's how big some of these planets and stars are. This is what God's created. So there's a huge variety of stars. Uh, and we know that from looking through telescopes. The most massive and luminous star is called R136A1. Why they couldn't come up with a name? You'd think they would have come up with a name. Mm -hmm. But they just come up with its R136A1. It has a surface temperature of 49,726 Celsius. It's nine times hotter than the sun. It's 265 times bigger than the sun. And it's 8.7 million times brighter than the sun. 8.7 million times brighter. If you put it on slide two, okay, that's the size of the sun to this other sun. It's a star. These are all different stars. And you notice they're different colours as well. Stars, all different, they're all different temperatures, they're all different colours, and they're all different sizes. The largest star known to man is one called UY. Scutty. <laughs> you see where I pronounce this right. It is 1,700 times larger than the sun. And then if we go to slide three, there's the sun. Is that how you say it? Scooty. 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 Thank you. Scooty. Scooty. Look at the size of the sun in comparison to that star. And do you know when they look out to space? All the seas are, are light. They don't see all the details. A lot of the time when you see the details on TV, by the way, it's, it's uh, computer generated. They just see dots. Mm -hmm. That's how big we're dealing with. That's how big that is, but it's still a dot in the telescope. There's many different types of stars in the universe, colour, size and temperatures. And they're finding them all the time. More and more stars. But you know, the scripture told us that that was the case already, that there was all sorts of different stars. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, 41, it says this, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial one is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. But then it says this, For one star differeth, differeth from another star in glory. The Apostle Paul wrote, he knew only what we've known for the last 50 years or so. 
he, he told us that these things differ. So the, the, the sonic else, we learned that scientists are telling us is that you can't number the stars. You can't number them. The observable universe is so huge, 46 billion light years in radius, that's halfway across, but it's using the centre, that it is estimated it contains about, are you ready for this number now? 10 to the 22nd power. That's 10 with 22 zeros. That's how many stars they believe are in the universe. Okay? Uh, this number is so vast, just give you an idea of how, how big this number is. That, that if you use a computer that could count a trillion every second, it would take you 300 years to come to that number. Yeah. Psalm 147.4 says, He determined the number of the stars, and he called them all by their names. Wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I missed that verse. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Scripture says this, Genesis 15.5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven, talking to Abraham, and tell the stars if they will be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall they, thy seed be. He's saying that no one can number the stars. No one can count them. In, in Jeremiah 33, 22, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Again, you can't count the sand on the seashore, you can't count the stars in heaven. And people have attempted to. Galileo, I think, got to about 30,000. <clears> and then people stopped after that. Ridiculous. Is there such thing there, in this vast universe that we live in, little green men <laughs> out there in their spaceships? Is there really such thing as aliens? Now, many evolutionists believe that there might be life on other planets, just like it appeared on Earth. You've got to remember they believe that uh, billions of years ago there was some pond scum, an electric bolt hit it, it produces amino acids and the amino acids formulated themselves or separated themselves left and right amino acids, produced proteins and these proteins put themselves together in a perfect order to produce one cell and that cell has to be a self-replicating cell, it's got to keep producing otherwise it dies. And then that started what we would see as life. And that's really what they believe. They've never ever been able to reproduce that in a lab. It, they know what the condition should be. They know, and they, but they've never been able to produce it in a lab. Which tells us that it's, it's got to be designed. If the most intelligent people in the human world can't even come close to creating life, then that must mean that whoever created life is far, far more intelligent. And so they believe if it could happen on this world, because that's by faith, never tell an atheist that we've got faith, they don't like it. But it is by faith. They believe it can happen on other worlds, that somewhere out there there's another Goldilocks effect, there's some other planet where life can come about. And as we'll see in future le lessons, we're going to see it, it, how complex life is and, and the impossibility, it's beyond possible. So for the idea of life to be on other planets, Let's just first of all look at it theologically. Now, normally people start to look at science uh, questions first. But this is where you should start as a Christian, theologically. Uh, it's interesting, you asked Adam the other day, and he got it straight away. Theologi there's theological problems with life on other planets. First of all, God gave man dominion over all the creation. If we see that in Genesis. This would mean that any chance of advanced aliens coming to Earth would counteract that idea. We're made in the image and likeness of God. What are they going to be created in? If they come here, you know, do they descend from Adam? There's another problem. When Adam fell, we read in the Bible that the whole creation was cursed. That means everything. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says, For we, ne we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And he's not talking about just the earth. He's talking about the whole creation. That's, they tell you, uh, there's a lesson there. That's how impactful Adam's sin was. It affected the universe. So if there's any little green men out there, they're cursed. They're under sin. Which means... That if they're not animals, they're, they've got to be saved. How do you save them? 
It doesn't make sense, does it, that God's going to do that? Another one, this would mean that all aliens would be under the curse and the judgment of God. Also, God took on human nature in the incarnation of Christ expressly so humans can be saved. He never did this for any other creature. I'm sorry if you're animal lovers, but there's no parrots in heaven. God never died for parrots, for the soul of parrots. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> he died for humans. He took on human form and died for us. He never took on the form of a Klingon. He never, none of that. Yeah. In the second coming, he sets up his kingdom on this earth. The whole plan of God is centered on the earth. Right. Not on planets out there. You know, he's coming in the future to be on this earth. And it surrounds the earth and man. Here's another one. Christ has a bride. Who's the bride? The church. It, it's implying that God has another plan and there's another wife out there. <laughs> God's not polygamous. Okay, he's not gonna he's not gonna marry more than one. So there's some theological problems, and I think if we dug deeper we could take some of them even further. But there's some scientific problems as well. Uh, the closest star system to ours is something called the Helfa Centauri, which is 4.37. Uh, light years away. So that means you've got to travel the speed of light for 4.37 years to get there. Yeah? That's the closest planet or, or, or solar system uh, that's, that's like ours. The travel speed itself is an issue. Consider an object moving at it's only a third of the speed of light, which is 100,000 kilometres a second. Okay. One spaceship weighing 10 tonnes, the ones we have now are 14 tonnes, carrying two men would need the energy of the whole earth for one month just to get there, okay? Just to get a month's travel. Such fast ships need to avoid sand grains. Why? You would just pass through it. When you're travelling, that's what I watched a video the other day, and this guy was in a lorry, and I think he had a turkey in this lorry. <laughs> And he, he pulled over on the motorway. I think he was in America, I think. And uh, he just had enough of this turkey jumping around in his lorry and he just let it out on the motorway. Well, he, he, he flew out and this car hit him. And then the next clip was this guy with all blood on his face. And this turkey had flown into the passenger seat of his car mm -hmm. and ripped the entire inside of his car off. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're travelling at speed and you're hitting still objects. Okay. So such fast ships need to avoid sand grains. Our fastest spacecraft at the moment is 22,000 miles per hour. These hypothetical spaceships are travelling 10,000 10, times faster. So even a snowflake hitting a spaceship at that speed would reduce the kinetic energy of 4 tonnes of TNT. So it, just a grain of sand it would blow it up. Okay. Another problem is G-forces. G, the, 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 the most G-force any human's ever been, I think it was just over 42 Gs, and it was for one second, and the guy ended up with broken ribs, you know, lots of other mental issues, internal bleeding and all. Uh, you can't travel too fast. What happens if we travel too fast? Stop at the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, especially when you stop. That's what happened in a car crash, you stop. Everything inside you carries on, and just basically, it's like being your brain's being bounced off your skull like a ball being thrown against the wall. So, G forces on the human body stopping and turning, like we see in these videos that people put. So, most humans wouldn't be able to handle, it, or humans wouldn't be able to handle this. So, what is it then that we see when people put videos out and we see videos? Well, it, it's either man-made or it's something else. You know, the scripture says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He owns this atmosphere, that is. Space and the sky are Satan's. Uh, and I really believe that in the last days something could happen where a deception comes along and someone comes on a spaceship or something along those lines. 
and says we can fix your welfare. Now, I wouldn't surprise if, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens in the future. But what's our attitude to that? Should we worry about that? No. No, we know the scriptures. We know that God's in control. He's in control of everything. Even if something like that did happen, I would be very sceptical of what it is that's coming off that spacecraft. Because I don't think it's of God. I do think it's of Satan. Mm -hmm. I really do. There's more to be said on that as well. So how can we see, another question quickly, how can we see then light from these stars from billions of years away? Light billions of years. Because this is one of the, the things they'll say to us is that the Earth can't be young. These lights, the light travel. So if you've got a star out here that's 15 billion light years away, it takes 15 billion light years for that light to come to the Earth. So you imagine if, let's say, that time scale is true, Say that star was just born, and it's 15 billion light years away, the light beam starts to travel at light speed towards the Earth, and it takes 15 billion light years for it to get there. Let's say in the 14th billion light year, that planet or that star is destroyed. We wouldn't even know for another 15 billion years. Okay? This is an argument against the idea that the Earth is young. So, how do we deal with that? God creates everything, first of all, with the appearance of age. Everything in creation is created with the appearance of age. You know, Adam and Eve, I never mentioned this last week, never had belly buttons. That's right. <laughs> they didn't have belly buttons. Because where did you get belly buttons from? Yeah, the umbilical cord. They were created without belly buttons. Okay? But they were created with the appearance of age. God never planted seeds and said, let's watch them grow. He created trees, he created animals, he created the chicken and not the egg. You know, he created everything with the appearance of age. So he created stars with the appearance of age, so light travel is possible. Uh, so the, the light would travel is a possibility we've got. Uh, another thing, remember we said that when God expanded the universe on day one, 92 billion light years across. God did it in a day. That means it's going to travel faster than the speed of light. Travelling the speed of light is not a problem for God. It's a problem for us. It's a problem for people who hold to the Big Bang Theory. Because to them, that is a genuine problem. They have that problem. There are stars that are further than 13.7 billion years out from the centre of the Earth. And the Earth is only 13.7 billion, or the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. So where did the light get to them? They have, they have the same problem, but we've got a solve. We we got the answer to the problem, the the, the solve uh, solution. solution to the problem. Thank you. Is God, because God's outside of space and time and matter. He's the God of all this. He created all this. It's not a problem to him. God closes out the day. And he says this, and the evening and the morning and were the fourth day. I just want to read a passage of scripture, Job chapter 12, and verse 7 through to 10. And we'll close with this. God speaking, he says, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fells of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the, sheep, uh, 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 of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord has wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Now God is saying, look at the creation, it testifies of me. He didn't ask the animals, he's not saying go up and do a doctor do it all. He's saying investigate them. Look at, look at creation, it's telling you, that I am the creator. Nothing but that. We'll close. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again as we've been going through the creation story. And Lord, we see your hand work. And Lord, it's, it's a testimony to who you are. And Lord, I know that there's people listening into this today. And Lord, it's an evidence. And you actually tell, tell us that in the book of Romans that we can look at the creation of this world and know that you exist. And so I pray, Lord, that if there's someone listening to this and they don't know you as their personal saviour, Lord, Lord, that today they can call upon you. 
Lord, that you have given this as a sign. And Lord, that we believe you. That your son came into this world to die for the sin, uh, for the sins of this world, Lord. And Lord, if we call upon his name, the scripture says we shall be saved. So I just pray that, Lord, your word never returns void. And so that it does its work today. And we thank you. Keep us safe as we go our separate ways. We pray for those at home who can't be with us today. And Lord, that they'll just be blessed. That there'll be a spirit of fellowship even though they're absent. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.